Hey there, Cousin here, and welcome back to Always Doing. I'm going to get right into today's video because it's my August part two wrap up, and even though as I film this, there's a couple days left in the month, I have a lot to talk about. So let's just jump right in. The first book I received as an advanced copy from the publisher, thank you, and it's upcoming. It's really, really upcoming. It comes out January 14th, 2020 you want to wrap your brain around that. It's American Manifesto, Saving Democracy from Villains, Vandals, and Ourselves by Bob Garfield. I asked for an advanced copy of this book because I like Bob Garfield. He's on a show called On the Media, where he co-hosts with Brooke Gladstone, and it's a podcast also on public radio. It's from WNYC in New York. And they talk about media and how it affects our lives and how stories and issues are covered can affect things and it's it's really fascinating and they do amazing work. It's a very long running show. I was listening to it back in college before podcasts were even a thing. So I feel like I have a feel for the way Bob Garfield thinks and I thought it would be interesting to see how it would relate to the page and how he would attack this topic of saving our democracy and what Gypsy had for us. Garfield's background is originally in advertising and you can tell that in a lot of the things he suggests. What I found most interesting is exactly how much of the online ad market is controlled by the combination of Google and Facebook and what that means for how money is spent and there were a lot of inner workings there that I had no idea about. So as I was going through the book, I was thinking it's about three stars. There's some good points, there's some boring parts, and that's fine. The writing style doesn't really connect in print as much as it does for radio. It sounds like he's writing to speak it on the radio, and I know what he sounds like on the radio so I can transpose that, but some things just don't work as well. For example, long lists. He'll just bring up example after example of something or other. And on the radio, it feels kind of overwhelming because you're going, wow, he's still, like if you do a list of mass shootings in the United States in the past even five years, it's, it gets overwhelming when you go, oh yeah, there's that one I forgot. Oh yeah, there's that one I forgot. But when they're all written out on a page in a paragraph, it just ends up feeling boring and I just skim it or skip to the bottom of that paragraph knowing I wasn't missing anything. Something else that I know from listening to him on the radio is that he has an irreverent tone at times and I have no problem with irreverence but in the book it skirts coarse, like dick joke level coarse. So I started with mm, mediocre three stars to mm, not quite so happy with the dick joke three stars uh, but then he said two things that really did not sit well with me. One is that he said we're splitting ourselves up into too many micro identities. And on one level, this I think this argument makes sense and work. If you think of the Democratic Party and then it's splitting up into all load of different kind of factions that all believe different things and they're fighting against each other instead of uniting to fight to save democracy, I get that. But he also talked about how people are splitting themselves up like, and I'm pretty sure he used LGBTQIA plus folks. As an example, by having a very specific identity for yourself, you're making yourself a target, so you shouldn't be surprised when you get attacked. Which, just what? And the other bit, which is related, that made me not happy, is that he said a colleague told him that he shouldn't open his speeches with ladies and gentlemen, and that he should use a phrase that is less, and the word he uses is oppressive. In general, that's something I agree with, that there are people outside of the gender binary, and if you just switch a simple word or a simple phrase from ladies and gentlemen to hello everyone or hello distinguished guests, or there's zillions of ways you can do it, you can include everybody and doesn't cost you anything. It's just a couple of words. And his view was that there's, you know, people getting shot and there's all these awful things happening in America. We have bigger fish to fry than how I start my speech. Which made me mad because here he is trying to tell us all to unite and he's using language that divides and actually says, hey you people that are outside the gender binary, I'm not even going to acknowledge you. So there are some good ideas in here, but it's mixed up with a bunch of stuff I found more boring and then that stuff at the end that made me mad, so it it's not a favorite. It won't be in my most anticipated reads for January, I am afraid. 20 minutes on one book, holy cow. So after worrying about the fate of democracy, I turned to romance and I read Better Off Red by Rebecca Weatherspoon. It is the first book in the Vampire Sorority Sisters series. And you heard that right. I love Weatherspoon, even though her books rarely get above like a three and a half stars from me, almost all of them are three and a half stars. She writes incredibly consistently and I love how inclusive her stories are, the different kinds of rep that she pulls in, how well thought out 
different aspects of the plot are and yeah so I, I love her and her next book doesn't come out till February and there aren't even advanced copies of it available yet so I needed to get my fill and that's why I turned to this. This is a paranormal FF romance and I found the world building interesting. It's a world very much like our own except they're vampires and the vampires in order to secure a blood supply a long time ago established a fraternity and a sorority. So students rush the fraternity and sororities. Some of them know what they're getting into, some don't, but the vampires do a very good job of picking who is suited for this sort of thing and everyone goes into it eyes open and they know what they're getting into when they sign up. What I liked about it is that it was very much a two-way agreement. Like yes, you're letting us drink your blood, but we will protect you and your loved ones for the rest of your life. And of course, getting fed on by a vampire is highly sexual and orgasmic, so that's a plus too. We follow Ginger and her roommate as they rush this sorority and they don't know what they're getting into. And then they do find out and Ginger ends up falling in love with one of the vampires, which is not like a done thing. And yeah, stuff goes from there. On the good side, we have Own Voices Lesbian Rep. We have a really neat look at what an ideal sorority or fraternity would look like. There's no hazing. It doesn't cost anything to join. Um, all of everyone's there for good reasons. It's incredibly diverse. They point out that at many of the sororities at the campus, all of the girls look samey, either uh, same race or you know, look like same socioeconomic group, that sort of thing. But in this sorority, every, there were Asian people and black people and poor people and rich people and just a big mix of everything. You get this feeling of sisterhood and I was thinking, why didn't I even look at sororities when I was in college? It wasn't even a, something I considered. And then I looked back at my university website and I remembered at my university how many problems they had with hazing and other stuff and I was like, oh yeah, that's why. One more good thing is that it's a first novel, but the world building is really solid. Weatherspoon thought out a lot of different little things, how this would work, how that would work. And I wasn't sure at the beginning if she had gotten down to the details, but by the end I was like, no, this world, she's got it. In the not so good column, the plot gallops at the end and a lot of stuff happens and someone might get turned into a vampire against their will. It's overwhelming in a way and it feels like okay we need to get this in to this end result and so all of this will happen in 50 to 75 pages and it was a bit much all in all though not bad for a first novel and i know that she's grown as a writer so i'm going to keep on going on in the series i think just to see what happens the next book i finished counts for women in translation month it's fruits basketto Fruits Basket number three by Takia Natsuki. I am blasting through the series and well blasting I'm on volume three out of like 22 but I'm reading them in order and timely like and I'm not going to go much into the plot. It's about a girl who falls in with a family that's cursed by the Chinese zodiac and this is Kyo on the cover. It's not like it's his volume or anything. Here we meet Haru for the first time and there's a scene at an onsen that uh, like a hot spring that I remember vividly from the original anime. So it was great to read that in manga form. I also like this particular volume because well, I got it used so it was cheap and it actually has the original obi from the original anime. And if you don't know what an obi is, check out my Bunko paperback video, which I'll link here and down below. But um, yeah, it was just kind of a blast from the past. I gave it three stars. I think it's gonna stay at three stars. It's solid, but it, it's not a volume that I anticipate myself going back to. The next book I finished is also for Women in Translation Month. It's Tentacle by Rita and Diana, translated by Achio Beas. It's a dystopian kind of book that starts in the future and we follow a young woman who is working as a maid and she learns that she has to go back into the past to save the oceans. But before she does, she needs to turn into the man that she always was. Well, it's queer, first of all, and the author's also queer and it's a mashup of time and themes. There are two main storylines that we follow that are completely separate to start and they, between the two timelines we end up in three main time periods and how all of this weaves together is quite interesting. What I will say is that if you decide to read this do try and read it in big chunks and in a short period of time. I stretched this out. I was trying to read this in stolen moments and on the train doesn't work so well because people's names change and things happen and there's a lot of threads to pull together 
through the storylines. The themes it touches on include politics, the art world, climate change, the health of our oceans, indigenous culture, colonialism, and this is all in 160 pages. Overall, I liked it, although if I were to reread it again for the first time, if that makes sense, I would read it in like one or two sittings. I would get more from it that way. I think I would also get more from it if I knew more about Dominican politics. I felt like they were riffing on something, but I wasn't sure quite what because I'm not familiar with the history. One thing that bothered me and gave me pause is that there is a main character that is racist and misogynistic, and it doesn't seem to serve a purpose. It's... they're mean. They're very mean. Oh yeah, and uh, content warning for an animal, a pet, being killed out of spite. That was enough for me being mean. Didn't need to be racist and misogynistic on top of it. Didn't feel like it served a purpose. And the ending is not an oh how nice kind of ending. It's a wait what kind of ending. And in that first two minutes after finishing the book, I was like, then why are why did I read this? What's going on? But as I thought about it more, it's kind of a metaphor for how humans now are dealing with climate change. And when I think about it like that, it's like, oh yeah, okay. I see, it's like, I appreciate that. I get where they're going with that, that's good. But the book as a whole, it's okay. It's all right. If it sounds interesting for you, go for it. But if it's out of your comfort zone, I, I don't know if you would enjoy it. The next book, also for Women in Translation Month, it is Alphabet by Inger Christensen, translated by Susanna Nied. And unfortunately, I didn't finish this one. I was very excited when I talked about this in my pile of possibilities because the poetry is based on the Fibonacci sequence and the alphabet, which is exciting. And I liked that structural basis that the poems are built on, but the poems themselves, I wasn't as much a fan. Fibonacci comes in in the number of lines per stanza, which is kind of cool. And the alphabet comes in in that like the first poem has lots of A words that start with A. The second poem has lots of words that start with B and so on. But the poems themselves started, they just felt like lists and there wasn't any insight or leaps of thinking or anything much interesting at all that I was getting from them, except for one poem, I forgot it was like the fifth or sixth poem or something that talked about the atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima. And that poem breaks out of the format a little bit and it that was a great poem i was really interested in that but then afterward like the next three poems were back to the same old same old and i just couldn't get through it i wonder how much of it is due to the translation it mustn't have been an easy job with all of the restrictions at the same time the restrictions can make for a wonderful translation i don't know if you've ever read um, exercises in style originally written in french i can't remember the author's name right now it's on the cover right here but uh, originally written in French. And the translation, I don't remember her name, I'll put that up too. It's amazing in English. It sounds like it was originally written in English and there are some ways when you know the deceit that's being used, that you know that the translator basically had to rewrite the thing from scratch, but it works, it is so good. So even translation with tech, tough technical restraints can be done, but it, this just wasn't working for me. So after all of that, I wanted something light, short, interesting, maybe nonfiction, and I went with a little tea book. It's by Sebastian Beckwith with illustrations by Wendy McNaughton. I first heard of this book from Bridget, who's over at the channel Breaky. I will link her down below. And she mentioned that she learned some stuff about tea and I thought, oh yes, well, I know a lot about tea, but she mentioned a couple of facts I didn't know. I was like, oh no, maybe this will be an interesting book. Beckwith goes around the world for his company. He sells teas that are single estate, so from one place, and that are ethically grown. And he knows his tea, he knows what he's getting into. And I like his whole philosophy in this book. He doesn't say thou shalt or thou must, you know, you must brew this tea at this temperature. He says, this tea usually likes being brewed at this temperature, but if you like the way it tastes, being brewed a different way, go for it. As long as it tastes good for you, it's good tea. And that's just refreshing. I knew a lot of the broad knowledge facts about tea, the differences between green, black, white. Yellow was a new one for me, but it turns out it's super rare, so I don't feel so bad for not knowing it. But he supplements this base knowledge with stories from his travels and 
There's beautiful photographs that he's taken as well, as well as the illustrations, which add to the, it's not, I won't say adorable, it's not quite that level, but it's a whimsical feel to the book. I think this is a great book if you have a tea drinker in your life that you need to get a birthday present for, or a stocking stuffer, get this book and then get them some really good loose leaf tea and, you know, or maybe a teapot, depends on how much of a gift you want to give. I think it would make a really great combination. And the last book I have to talk to you about today is Illuminate, the first in a trilogy, I think, by Amy Kaufman and Jake Kristoff, and this ended up being a DNF. I had really high hopes for this because it's epistolary. It pulls together all kinds of communications and transcripts to build a case file for something awful that went down in the middle of space. Uh, there was a colony out there that was illegally built, but uh, some people came and fired on it and tried to destroy it, which isn't allowed either. And this is the whole aftermath. It includes like a plague, which I wasn't expecting, which makes me interested because it's medical and uh, other stuff. I love, love, love epistolary novels. And I loved getting into this. I like reading between the lines and figuring out what people aren't saying and what that means as far as their character or their relationships with other people, all that kind of stuff. And I was really digging that for the first maybe 160 pages. And then it kind of gets boring for a while. And then I read on Goodreads that it picks up again at like 30%-ish. And I got to that point and it picked up and I was happy again for a little while, but then it just evolved again. I think my main issue is that we have two main characters here, a guy and a girl, and they love each other, but we're never like, shown that love, we're told about it all the time, and how their relationship went in the past, but I, I'm just not getting that connection feeling between them as if we had seen the relationship grow. When we first get into the book, they're, they've broken up, and then, you know, fire starts raining down from the sky, they end up on different spaceships running away from the bad guys and they're sending messages to each other about how much they love each other. So mm. one thing that kept pulling me through the book when other stuff was holding me up is the AI of the ship when it awakens and starts talking. I found it incredibly interesting and just the way it speaks and it's reasoning and everything. I could get on board with that, but it was just all the other stuff I was done with. It's a 600 page book. It reads fast because of all the different formatting stuff that's going on, but I ended up DNFing it in the high 300s. It just wasn't for me. So there we have it, my August wrap up part two. Have you read any of these books? I know some of them are pretty divisive, especially Illuminae. A lot of people love it and I can see why you love it, but it just didn't work for me. I don't, am I too old? I don't know. Let's have a gab down in the comments below about any of the books or anything at all. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you're new and I will see you in the next video. Bye.